turn to second peter chapter two my point of tulip is irresistible grace irresistible grace and the title of this sermon is irresistible grace is a lie irresistible grace is a, is a lie what irresistible grace teaches is that god forces repentance and regeneration on you that you can't resist you know just from wikipedia it says according to calvinism those who obtain salvation do so not by their own free will, but because of the sovereign grace of God. So right off the bat, like we've been seeing, they take away the free will. They take away your choice to decide to be saved. It also says, that is, men yield to grace, not finally because their conscience were more tender or their faith more tenacious than that of other men. So it's saying they yield to grace, not because of their conscience, not because of their faith. It's because God makes them that way. That's right. Right? It says, rather, the willingness and ability to do God's will are evidence of God's own faithfulness to save men from the power and the penalty of sin. And since man is dead in sin and slave to it, he cannot decide or be wooed to follow after God. So what it's saying is that man can't be persuaded. That man can't decide for themselves to believe in God. It says... God must powerfully intervene by giving him life and drawing the sinner to himself. It's saying that God forces repentance and faith on you. It says God is going to change you without you even knowing. It also says Calvinism argues, th this blows my mind, that regeneration must precede faith. That regeneration must precede faith. It's saying that before, God's, before God gives you faith, he makes you change your life. And then faith comes, then you believe, then you're going to continue to do God's will. That's what it's teaching. <clears throat> it says you will endure to the end. It says you will reach sinless perfection. It says, Calvin says, that is not violent so as to compel men by external force. So it's saying God doesn't do this physically, but it says, but still it is the powerful impulse of the Holy Spirit. Now watch this. They've been saying that we don't have free will, right? But watch what it says. It, let me find my spot here. It says, But still it is the power, impulse of the Holy Spirit, which makes men willing who formerly were unwilling and reluctant. So it contradicts their own self, right? <coughs> but this, it says, But that is the Holy Spirit that makes men change to do the will of God. So what irresistible grace teaches is that before you even have faith, God makes a divine intervention in your life, makes you do good works, then, you, then faith comes, and then after that faith you believe in God, and you continue to do God's will until you reach sinless perfection. That you can't resist the power of the Holy Spirit to work in your life. But go to, So you're in 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to read to you from uh, no, you're in Second Peter. I'm gonna read to you from Second Timothy chapter three eight. It says, "Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth." That's a choice. They resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. These guys rejected the truth. They resisted it. So God rejected them. They had a choice to believe in God. It says in Acts seven fifty one. It says, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, do so, uh, so do ye. So they're resisting the power of the Holy Spirit. Not only do they resist the Holy Spirit, but even their fathers from the beginning of time have been resisting the Holy Spirit. They've had that choice to resist the Holy Spirit. You're in 2 Peter. Look at verse 1. <clears throat> It says, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresy, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So first, it says that they denied the Lord. Right. That's resisting God. Amen. That, that's choosing to reject God. It says they're resisting the power of the Holy Spirit. And not only that, 
talking about God died for all men, it says, even denying the Lord God that bought them. The Lord bought all men. Jesus Christ bought all men by the death, burial, and resurrection. It's your choice if you want that price put in your account. <clears throat> in verse 2 it says, And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. So these people want to say that God chooses who goes to heaven, who goes to hell. God chooses those that will receive life and those that will receive damnation. And they have no choice. It's not on their own will. But look at verse 12. It says, But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. It's their own corruption that condemns them to hell. It's not God. It's their own corruption. <clears throat> um, you know, whether you're saved or unsaved, you can resist the Holy Spirit. It's not just safe, it's not just unsaved people that resist the Holy Spirit. You know? But here it's saying that these people have resisted the power of God and shall perish in their own corruption. In Ephesians 4:30, talking about saved people. It says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. So when you're a child of God and you're not walking in the law of God and you're not following God, you are resisting the Holy Spirit. You are choosing not to follow God. You're resisting the Holy Spirit. Turn to Romans chapter 7. So, so some verses they go to, I want to look at some verses they go to to prove that this irresistible grace, that God will just come upon you without your choice and that He will make you regenerate, that He will lead you to sinless perfection and you have no choice, <clears throat> that you can resist the Holy Spirit. In Ezekiel 36, 26, this is one of their uh, texts. It says, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. So they say if you're elect, if you're God's elect, God will give you a new, a new spirit to do His will. And you can't resist that. You will always do His will. And they'll couple this with Romans 8 verse 5. It says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. To be carnally minded is death, but to be sp spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So they say if you're, if you're elect, if you're a son of God, you can't resist the work of the Holy Spirit. And you will perform God's will no matter what. They take away your choice. You know, let's, let's see what the Bible actually teaches. Yes, there will be a day if you're saved, you're going to reach sinless perfection. But it's not in this lifetime. Right. It's not in this lifetime. <clears throat> uh, go to, are you in Romans chapter 7? You know, there will be a day that we will be conformed to the image of God's Son. So... Let's look one chapter back from chapter 8. Let's look at uh, Romans 7. And let's see what Paul is teaching here that leads up to Romans 8. It says in verse 7, Romans 7, 7. It says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. He's saying if we didn't have the law, we wouldn't know sin. If we didn't have the Bible, we wouldn't know our wrong way. Look at verse 10. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. He's saying this law is perfect. This law is ordained to life. But I found, but what I, he says, I found to be unto death because I am not perfect. 
So this perfect law he found to be unto death because he's not perfect. He can't obtain to the law. He falls short of the glory of God. Look at verse 11. It says, For sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. So since the law was so perfect, I'm realizing it's not perfect, and I can't obtain to it. It says, Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Verse 13. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. He's saying that the law is good because it made me die. It made me realize that I can't obtain to God's glory. I can't obtain to God's perfection. He says it's good because it shows me that I'm a sinner and that I can't reach sinless perfection. Look at verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. So he's saying, he's saying the things that I do, I don't want to do. And then he says, for what I would, so he's saying what I want to do, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. So we see this battle going along. He wants to do good things, but he's finding himself falling short. He's wanting to obtain to sinless perfection, but the law is too good. He can't. He can't obtain to it. It says, verse 16, If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. He's saying because I admit that I am sinner, I'm testifying that God's law is good and I am not. Because I admit I'm a sinner, I'm testifying that the law is good and I am not. Verse 17, now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So he's going to define what he means by this. Verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. He says, I try to be perfect in the law, but I can't find a way to do it. I try to be perfect in law, but I can't find a way to do it. Why? Because in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. <clears throat> Verse 19. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. So he's saying, I desire to do God's will. But I can't perform it because evil is with me. I desire to do God's will, but I can't. Verse 22. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So Paul holds, Paul's whole point in telling us that while we are in this body, we will never attain to sinless perfection. We will never attain. We, we will always resist the Holy Ghost in certain times in our life. We can never reach that sinless perfection. And when, when is this going to be done away with? When are we going to reach this? Look at verse 24. It says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? So the whole point is, while you're in this body, it's this body of sin that keeps us from being sinless. While you're in this body, you're never going to reach that uh, sinless perfection. Turn to Ezekiel 36. It says in uh, Romans 7.25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So we see these two, these two attributes of a, a somebody that's saved. You know, we have the law of our mind. We have that inward man. And then we have that flesh that's with us. You know, in 1 John 3, 9, it says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him. He cannot sin because he is born of God. So the part of us that is born of God is our spirit. Our spirit does not sin. It's sealed. It says, uh, if we say that we have no sin... We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So the part of us that does sin is our flesh. 
So when, you know, Paul says, it's not no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. That's the flesh. So Calvinism is an error because they can't distinguish between the flesh and the spirit. They, they have not the Spirit of God. They can't distinguish it. They believe you can't resist the Holy Spirit. And therefore, you can reach sinless perfection in this body. Right. That's where they're messing up. That's a worse based salvation. That's a worse based salvation. So let's go to their scripture they use. And let's see in context when this is. So in verse 24, Ezekiel 36, verse 24, it says, For I will take you from among the heathen, and gather you out of all countries, and I will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. Remember that phrase. I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Yes, when we get saved, we get sealed by the Holy Spirit. And that inward man is sealed. That inward man can't sin. But I believe this is talking about the manifestation of a Son of God receiving the adoption of our body. <clears throat> and we'll keep reading here in verse 28. And ye shall dwell in the land that I give to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. That's quoted in Revelation, when the tabernacle of God is with men. And he says, they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Look at uh, Ezekiel 37, <clears throat> verse 1. We're going uh, to read the, in context what this is talking about. When is this going to happen? It says, The hand of the Lord was upon me. Now this is out of their, their go-to text. If you just go in context, this is what it's teaching. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. And caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. And lo, they were very, they're, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. And again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. So it's talking about the resurrection. Yes, it and also it says here, the Son of Man, this is Ezekiel representing Jesus. Yeah. Jesus said there's going to come a day where all that are in the graves will hear my voice, referring to the Son of Man, referring to Jesus Christ. Right. <coughs> it says in verse 6, And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the sin and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. So Ezekiel is seeing a vision of people rising from the graves. Look at verse 9. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel, New Jerusalem. That's us. He's seeing us in heaven. He's seeing us in heaven in sinless perfection because we have a new body. It says, Behold, they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. Look at verse 14. And I shall put my spirit in you. So when is this happening? When is their go-to text happening? The At the resurrection. Yeah, yeah. And you shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I am the Lord, have, that I the Lord have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Verse 27. My tabernacle also shall be with them, 
Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So turn to uh, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. So in context, this is the same when we're getting our glorified body. One day, we will be at a state of sinless perfection. But it will be when we get our new body. It will not be in this flesh. You know, in 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about our glorified state. It says, all flesh is not the same flesh. But there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. So this body has its own glory, but we have a better glorified body coming. It says, There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star different from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. So what we've been talking about. It is sown in corruption. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? It is raised in incorruption. That's our new glorified body. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. So irresistible grace is a false doctrine. You know, it teaches, you know, whether you're saved or unsaved, you can resist the power of the Holy Spirit. You can resist it. It's your choice. You choose who you want to follow, whether you're saved and unsaved. You know, but our goal should be to try to walk in the Spirit to the best of our ability. But we know that while we're in this flesh, we're going to fall short. But we should strive for that. In Galatians 5, 16, where you're at, it says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So we should strive to walk in the Spirit. We should strive after the law of God, after the inward man, to the best of our ability. It says, For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so you can't. So that you cannot do the things that you would. It's going to be tough. It's going to be a struggle. But that's why we have victory through Christ. We have victory through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That we choose to believe in. That we choose to believe in. It says, But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So let us strive for perfection. But realizing we're going to fall short. Realizing we're going to mess up. But if we fall and we mess up, just confess our sins before God. It says in 1 John 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all, all unrighteousness. So let us be patient. Endure hard times. Just looking for the coming of the Lord when this body will be delivered from sin. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So with the mind, I myself serve the law of God but with the flesh, the law of sin. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth. I just thank you for this ministry. I just pray that you bless our fellowship tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.